Hi, everyone. Welcome to the very last Bartlett guest seminar series of the semester, Speculative Design, which discusses the meaning, impact, and applications of speculation in design. So this series is both interdisciplinary and intercultural. Every seminar, we invite guests from all over the world from different disciplines to discuss a sub-theme. So the format of the seminar is a roundtable. Everyone is given equal rights to participate. So welcome to ask our guests um, any questions by turning on your cameras at any time or typing in the chat box down below. So challenge them on the speculative. Today, we have some very, very special guests because we have guests who are actively practicing in the physical world and also in the educational virtual world to discuss with us the speculative. For sure, it will be an interesting discussion on how futures become realized and to what extent can futures be realized and what is actually the physical constraint when speculations touch his ground. This is also one of the reasons why this was uh, chosen as the closing seminar of the semester. So yesterday we had a Bitcoin strategist, um, the founder of 21E8, who gave an interesting pitch during the round table on speculative asset, which I think can be quite relevant for our discussion today. He basically said that speculation, it's really practical, useful design toolkit to ask questions about what is possible as long as you have the capacity to influence on the decision. Even if just in the hypothetical artistic space, just publish it, put put it on YouTube, Instagram, or whatever. So today I'm pretty excited to talk to a practicing architect with 20K followers uh, and a founder to a very influential educational platform. Speaking of which, just a heads up for everyone, this is the seventh seminar of the series. Previously, we had experts who discussed with us topics on strategic foresight, collaborative intelligence, the digital, and many more. So if you missed the previous seminars, do not fear. You can always go back to them on the Instagram or on my YouTube channel. Just search Provise ISM. You should be able to find it. So without further uh, delay, today, the seminar invites Mariana Kabugira from Saha Hadid and Famsi Fimiri from Futurely to discuss their practice in high-end design and hybrid fields in architecture and share their experiences and visions on the future of architectural education as a global platform. So a little warm introduction to our guest today. Mariana is an architect and urban designer from Portugal, recently working as a senior architectural designer at Saha Hadid Architects, teaching at the Architectural Association in London and doing live workshops and webinars with students from all around the world. Graduating from the School of Architecture in Lisbon, she moved to London to explore design and technology through the postgraduate course, Design Research Laboratory, DRL. So her research interests gravitate around parametric design, generative design, digital design, and the evolution of architecture through the use of technological means such as robotic fabrication. She's part of the competition cluster at Saha Hadid, responsible for the high-end design projects of the office. She was also part of the design team of winning projects such as the Navi Mumbai Airport, Western Sydney Airport, Exhibition Center Beijing, and most recently, the Tower C in Shenzhen. So our second panelist, Famsi, is a speculative architect, entrepreneur, educator based in Germany. He operates at the intersection of speculative design, immersive media, and real-time visualization. Having been an active educator conducting workshops, webinars, and lectures across Europe and Asia, he co-founded Futurely, a global platform for advanced architecture and design learning. Through their research studio, they have developed various speculative and experimental projects, including Silicon Culture and Saha 6122124, that have been exhibited in various platforms and design conventions across the US, UK, Germany, India, Latvia, and Japan. So without further ado, let us welcome our first guest, Mariana. <laughs> Thank you, Provide. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction as well. I'm gonna get started so uh, because I only have one hour, 45 mm -hmm. minutes, so let's start. Okay, so I have only 15 minutes, so this is gonna be a really, a real quick one, but I hope that it's good enough. 
Uh, so like Provide said, she did an amazing introduction. Uh, so I'm going to recap really fast. I'm a senior architectural designer at Zaha Did Architects. I'm from Portugal. I also teach at the DRL Maya and I teach Maya also live uh, for the last year and a half. And today I will be talking about four very quick um, chapters that I consider to be relevant for the topic, the speculative um, design in architecture. So I'll be talking a little bit about uh, where I come from, um, how was uh, speculative design introduced in my life uh, without knowing that you are a, a speculative designer. And, and then I'll talk about how do I manage speculative design in my uh, daily life? So I usually can separate them in two different chapters. So I do a speculative architectural that is non-fictional. So it's the one that gets on site and that is more political. And then a speculative design that I decided to do on my own uh, for classes and for my own content, okay, which is absolutely fictional. Uh, in the end, I would like to leave a few words about a speculation of what kind of architects are going to be uh, in the future and what happens to education in the future as well. It will be a very quick um, chapter, but I think it will be one of the most relevant. So starting from the beginning, I was a student at um, the School of Architecture in Portugal. I also did one year in the Politecnico di Milano, and then I moved to London. I did a very uh, non-typical academic um, career. It was not an easy one. It was eight years. I do not recommend anyone to do this. Uh, eight years, it is a headache and it's unnecessary. But the reason why I did eight years of study was because I was a speculative designer. I, I felt that that was design in architecture and I was in a country that did not believe uh, a lot in design, uh, in architecture. Actually, they would feel that bringing design into architecture would be a bit arrogant and ambitious and superficial. Uh, so I am from a country that is really still very modernist, still very much into Corbusier and into the simplicity stripped down architecture that is the value criteria in Portugal. Unfortunately, I was not like that. Uh, I had my own world. I really created uh, new scenarios, new agencies, and I was really into uh, architecture that translates these ag agencies and these crazy scenarios, right? So that was not going very well when I was studying. Uh, so obviously when I finished, it was very obvious that I had to do something else. I had to move my country and then go to somewhere else and learn how to deal with this, how to create these new scenarios with which tools, okay? This is something that we all question whenever we are interested in um, design and architecture. We all question what kind of tools should I, should I do and where can I learn this? Uh, that was a very good place for me, which was the DRL. I found it almost randomly. And uh, because it was not very known in Portugal. So when I found it, I was very curious and it was it, it fit me 100%. So in the DRL, as you know, you have three studios. You have the US Parapolis studio, which is more around uh, agency and units and assembly. You have Sajay's and Alicia's studio, which is more around robotic fabrication, but especially um, how to prepare a geometry for robotic fabrication. And then you have Patrick Schumacher's studio, which kind of uh, mimicates the culture inside of an office. Okay, so you have a brief. It's the fictional, but less fictional kind of uh, design. You have a brief, you have a project, and you have to still do research and still have a theory behind, and you still have to uh, be more of a speculative fictional uh, designer than the non-fictional, okay? You still are working with a completely different scenarios. So I picked Patrick's studio, um, as you can see, absolutely fictional, but with a very grounded research. It was based on topology optimization. This was my theory, and it was um, kind of showing how you, how from topology optimization, you can strip down the tower to its uh, minimal forces uh, structure and kind of create an exoskeleton that frees the interior of the tower from any structure elements. Okay, so for example, this, you can see that the structure is going around. So again, extremely speculative, extremely fictional, but with a grounded research behind that, when they can actually help a real project. It was a lot of fun, obviously a lot of work. And then by the end of the final uh, presentation of the DRL, I applied to Zaha uh, through Patrick and I joined Zaha to a very peculiar cluster, which is the competition cluster. So 
as you know, in big offices, you have uh, departments, obviously. Um, in Zaha, they, call, they are called clusters. So you have cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. And then there's one very particular one, which is funny enough, the most speculative of them all. And it's the, this, the competition cluster, it's a Z cluster. It's a cluster created by Zaha not many years ago, like 15 years ago, let's say. And basically she gathered uh, most of the big designers of the office in the same floor. And she said, you guys take care of the high-end design competition of this office. Uh, because what does it mean high-end? As you can imagine, no office does only high-end design. They do normal projects that you never get to see, uh, the public never gets to see, but they are a bit more um, ordinary projects that are the bread and butter of the office. That's a common in every office that you know. And then there's this side of the office that is the one that we get to see published, which is the high-end one, the Chanel one. Uh, and this is this comes uh, mainly from my cluster uh, with collaboration with the, the other cluster. So when I joined this cluster, design and um, pushing the design boundaries, okay? I am asked to push the design boundaries to, again, speculate on how can design be pushed and how can agency change the way uh, humans interact, the way uh, functionality gets performed. I'm asked to think about this uh, because again, this is a different kind of project inside of the office. Um, and because of that, there is one thing that we all have in common, which is the digital tool that we run. And it's a very particular digital tool because it's the best digital tool where you can translate a very uh, fictional world, the gaming world, the, the movie world, the cyberpunk world into a real world. Okay, so Maya was brought into the office by Zaha as a tool that sh shifts brilliantly from the non-fictional to the to, from the fictional to the non-fictional okay from the speculative scenarios to the non-fictional still uh, speculative scenarios which is architecture so maya does this amazingly uh, for the ones who do maya you do understand what i mean uh, it's a very free tool i'm going to run through very basics of some of some of the basic principles of the software um so it is not it's not a software like rhino it does not uh, not everything is a polygon okay it basically manipulates meshes and meshes through faces object edges and vertices and that's the base of my you manipulate all of these four components and you get projects done like this so for example it's very obvious how maya operates in this project this is a an exercise that i usually do with my students Students for beginners. And um, it's a, a very good tool for your hand sketch to be translated in 3D with total freedom. Okay. So from, from a scenario that you imagine, you can put it as real architecture, non-fictional architecture directly from this tool. So that's why it became the ultimate one uh, for this office. And it kind of allowed uh, the office to do all of these designs that, uh, as you can imagine, can shift from very different scales. That's a very signature thing of the office, shifting from a little skylight of the Serpentine Gallery to a huge skylight on the Beijing. Um, so it's this transition from what seems to be an outer world kind of project that it's actually very real and very non-fictional. Okay, uh, so what do I do um, nowadays as a um, speculative designer and architect? I do believe that we are all speculative designers, all architects since uh, the beginning of time. If we create, it does mean that we are speculating. Uh, some of us really follow what we speculate. Some of us also rationalize a lot what we speculate. So it's less obvious, but any creation action involves speculation. It's not uh, a niche. It's, uh, it's in we have it all in common. Uh, I am fortunately in an office that um, makes you want and, and kind of asks you to speculate higher and to bring completely different scenarios from your head to reality. So that's something that I'm really fostered to do. And um, that's something also that I'm very fortunate to be in an office that um, puts these real realities in um, place. Okay, so it takes the fictional to the non-fictional. Uh, so that's 
one of the things that I'm really fortunate about. So all of these non these fictional scenarios that I created since I was younger, uh, today I can actually bring them to the table and they are considered for the reality. So basically um, these non-fiction, these fictional scenarios became uh, feature possibilities for architecture. And that's, I think something that we really, we all want, look forward to some of us. And um, this that you're looking at is the Tower C in Shenzhen. It's a competition that I did last year. I worked five months in this competition. Uh, we were a very small team of designers at that point. We were four people designing. Um, the brief was very simple. It was twin towers for a site in Shenzhen. Uh, they were really high. They were 400 meters high in the brief. And then um, I had this idea of kind of merging the towers, which is not you know, the inventing of the wheel, but it made the tower look different. So they, they don't look like twin towers anymore. They are hugging each other. And then my lead designer brought this crazy and super cool idea of opening this wing and bringing the park up uh, to the tower. And obviously these were a thousand of different sketches. I've done towers that are completely out of this world that make absolutely no sense to reality. And then in a way we started growing, the team started growing, we became 30 or something. And in a way we brought these fictional scenarios to uh, real scenarios, uh, still speculative um, scenarios though. So we had to create a narrative that kind of um, integrates this new tower with the current network of Chenzhen and still thinking about what kind of community is this, what kind of culture is this, what kind of culture are we creating with this? Okay, so uh, speculation is still there, even though this is a completely uh, non-fictional project. And then one very interesting culture in the office, uh, not everyone does it, but it's funny how uh, cyberpunk scenarios and all of these Blade Runner scenarios are kind of um, a big interest on any designer. Uh, all of my friends and colleagues of, of the office are obsessed with the Blade Runner and the cyberpunk and, and um, these very gaming speculative scenarios that uh, in a way we start bringing to the projects and we have fun with it. And then uh, we also ask for the final renders to kind of transmit that idea. So I, I read a very interesting article about this, that in reality, the non-fictional uh, architecture and non-fictional design actually hijacks uh, this speculative design from games and from films and from fiction. And they kind of bring that language into reality. And that's something that we do uh, very actively in the in practice in the office so we won the project we won the project in november um it was very cool i was obviously very happy uh, i think we were neck and neck with un studio and i had a friend at un studio from drl who was doing the same competition and it, that was fun <laughs> that we won <laughs> and um he will get his revenge soon and now uh, nowadays i'm actually doing um the other side of the project, which is the construction and the detailing uh, for the next year. So I'm moving further and further away from whatever is speculative and whatever is non-fictional or fictional to the reality of the project, which is uh, a new dimension that I'm still very interested because I am uh, in my heart uh, an architect. So I'm still happy about it. And then I want to bring you another non-fictional project, uh, still speculative, but uh, you do uh, get to see the difference. So if there's something, uh, this was the Sydney airport. It was done a year or two years ago. It was also a competition that we won. Um, it was, it's going to be built now. And it's very interesting because when I joined this airport, I was bringing these crazy um, ideas and design, a lot more fluid. And the real, the option that went forward and that, that was picked by the office was a very simple one, a very humble one, and uh, an absolutely grounded project. So there was no crazy uh, environments, no crazy speculations. It was very real and it had a lot of respect for the culture. And that's something that um it's less obviously Zaha as someone would say because the aesthetics is completely different but there's this kind of respect for the environment there's a respect for the way even in politics the way it gets built it gets built in Sydney they are not importing from anywhere so it is in a way a super grounded project and that's something that 
uh, I have a lot of respect in architecture. We do not have to have speculative scenarios that are completely fictional and completely gaming and completely like movies. Uh, we are still doing architecture and in architecture, there's a lot of politics. Uh, which does not mean that we need, politics does not mean a bad thing. It doesn't mean corrective. It doesn't mean money. Politics means respecting the culture, respecting the community, acting in the collective. So that's something that this project brought. And um, it was a very big lesson for me, how from elegancy and from uh, this kind of uh, singularity of space and not overly complex still brings architecture to another level and it still uh, flatters architecture. And then there's another side of my life, which is the uh, speculative architecture, absolutely fictional. So obviously we all have a drive for creativity and we all have a drive for completely different scenarios that don't need to touch the ground. And uh, that's something that I started looking on my own autonomously outside of the office. I, I'm not just the employee of the office. I decided to have my own uh, stuff and my own ideas on the side. And this was also combined with the need of teaching Maya. Uh, so Maya, it is, I am pretty convinced, that one of the best tools to move from the non-fictional to, from, to move from the fictional to the non-fictional. Maya does this amazingly. You have animation and Pixar and DreamWorks doing Maya, but you can still do this in architecture. And it's in what you see in reality, it is uh, from Maya. So I decided I'm gonna teach the software. It's not very known. It's kind of a niche, not everyone does it, uh, knows Maya. So um, it's time to kind of share my knowledge. So I became a teacher at the DRL for four years, uh, two official ones. And um, usually it's a very successful, successful class. Uh, it's a full house most of the times, um, very demanding, but the students get uh, very, very good. And then I also started teaching life for the last year and a half to take Maya completely out of the niche. Uh, so this is widespread and, and the knowledge gets to be widespread. And so I was working in this case, it was an workshop with Future Lee, with Mamzi and Arek. And then I also do live academy. I also do my own uh, workshops, most of them collaborating. That's something that I want to talk about later. And for example, you get to see how Maya is used by your students after you teach them. It's absolutely rewarding. Okay. So you get to see their own scenarios, the way they see agency and the way they see design uh, used by Maya in this case, absolutely superb in a superb way uh, to another level. And uh, it's amazing how Maya really translates their scenarios into uh, these visuals. This is the work from DRL last year. And then uh, these are some of my classes online. So again, this is a kind of architecture that is not meant to touch the ground, okay? This is speculative. And not just that, this is also an exercise that teaches you how to run the tool. And that's something that is very important. So whenever I'm teaching Maya, I am not teaching a project. I am teaching you how do you uh, learn this tool and what are the best techniques. And that's what the projects look like, okay? They come from the technique that is meant to be um, taught and not for a project. So these are some of the um, classes that I've done with Futurely. So as you can see, I am not proposing an architecture. I'm not proposing anything to touch the ground. This is meant for you to learn a tool and that's really important. Obviously it comes from my own scenarios and from my own imagination. Uh, but again, this is just to kind of um, teach the tool to its maximum. And uh, this is another workshop that I did with Futurely. Uh, obviously, the, um, in this case, actually, it was the only case that I took a step further to architecture, which is not something that I do very commonly when I'm teaching, because there's no need. Uh, but in this case, I kind of brought this project to another level, which is a bit more architectural, a bit more uh, simulating space and simulating a function. And this is my last one, which is um, even more speculative. It was a collaboration with uh, Chantal Matari was uh, bringing Maya and Houdini together. So it was also a very generative process. Uh, still, obviously you can tell that Maya is a lot more architectural and it's a lot more real than the Houdini part. So that's something that you cannot run away from the software basically. Um, it went really good and then again, um, I actually put it on a CT, but it, do, it doesn't have to. It's still a very conceptual idea. 
So I'm going to finish with my last chapter where I think that it's uh, relevant to talk. It is um, what kind of architects are we going to be in the future and should we start uh, being now, right now? So I do believe that uh, currently there are no excuses for you not to share your knowledge, okay? Uh, there are many, many doors open for you to share your knowledge. And not just that, we have a lot of people who really are interested to know uh, what you know. And um, this is absolutely open in the digital world. Uh, it's something that it is not a niche. It's very out to the public. So I do think that in the future, we do have to continue sharing our knowledge in a more, more common way than we do in schools, for example, and in a more personal way than what you do in schools. It's a relation between teacher and student with no institution behind. Okay? This is what I have been doing in the last year. I also think that we have a responsibility to visit foreign realities. And uh, when I mean foreign realities, I don't mean just what we have in our brain and in our mind that is super crazy and amazing and creative, but there are a lot of other realities that are um, in the world. They are real, they are built. So uh, you should not only visit your own realities, but you should also look for the other ones, understand what's behind culture, understand what's behind uh, the architecture of this culture. So traveling is something that I really think every architect should do. Um, Corbusier traveled for a year and a half on his own just for this, and this was in the 50s. So in 2020, I think we should uh, travel a lot more than we do and then obviously you get to be the architecture uh, the architect that does fictional architecture and does non-fictional uh, speculative architecture okay i am a bit of both i like both um i'm still leaning towards the non-fictional one i like construction i like detailing i think it's valid both ways um i know that non-fictional architects feed a lot from the fictional ones so and and the other way around as well so i think that uh something that will it will continue in the future and then there are also no excuses for you to uh, not collaborate with people from different completely different parts of the world so i'm collaborating with provides i'm collaborating with vamsi and uh, nowadays we everything gets done digitally you can even be in competitions with people in completely different places in the world and uh, work with them digitally so this is something that i have very present in my days i collaborate i work alone uh, I do fictional and non-fictional uh, speculative architecture, and I travel quite a lot. And I think that's my 15 minutes. Thank you so much. I was really surprised when you were talking about Blade Runner, because I don't think I've seen you talking about that in, in other places <laughs> before. Uh, but for sure, we will have an interesting roundtable. But before that, let us welcome Fancy. Hey, guys. <laughs> That was a wonderful presentation, Mariana. Yeah, thank you, Mariana. <laughs> thank you. <Yes. laughs> Let me quickly share my screen. Too many monitors. Yeah, <laughs> it's one large monitor, so. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, it works fine. Perfect. Yeah, so my short presentation for today is called virtual and hybrid fields. I think uh, I would probably expand uh, more on the speculative side uh, of the presentation because I hold not so much experience in uh, the construction uh, side of architecture and the physical side of architecture, but rather I spend a lot of my time in the speculative and the virtual side of architecture. So to begin with, I'll briefly touch upon different fields and talk about the kind of spaces, the forms and the experiences that emerge from the intersection of these diverse set of fields. So let's start off by understanding what a field means in this context. I'm gonna keep it short because uh, most of you are architects, I believe. And uh, so to begin with, it's, uh, we all know the architectural grid that exists in our drawing space, the master plans, or computer interfaces and software. So most often we are dealing with homo homogeneous or uniform grids that we see in our tools and software. So let's uh, assume or take a non-uniform, non-homogeneous force acting in a space, and that is called a field. 
And a superimposition of multiple fields is what creates a city or what creates an urban contexture, as we know as in architecture. So, for example, we have layer upon layer superimposed and entangled, and that's what we call a city of the present day. So these layers sometimes are digital, physical, and hybrid. So that's uh, precisely where we are at. And before we proceed, I'd like to present the model of the stack by uh, uh, theorist Benjamin Bratton, which forms an underlying foundation of how various fields are stacked upon as layers, and that indeed serves as a literal and technical prototype of how different network architectures operate between very small and large scales and how a large set of stakeholders engage with it. That's what we call the world, uh, different cities, states, countries. And so thus he calls stack as the accidental megastructure for a geopolitical architecture. So having said that, um, I'm particularly interested in three fields, um, or at least the virtual side of the fields that I mentioned earlier. Uh, most of you, most often do not, I'm sure you've heard of these terms before, the virtual augmented and uh, mixed realities or merged realities. And there are a lot more uh, other realities that have come into play, um, such as sensory realities and XR. They're all broad uh, terms that we use in the present day. But uh, just to give you a short differentiation between the three, so VR is a completely disconnected space from the real world, like the world we see in Ready Player One or other video games. While augmented reality is an overlay um, that we perceive through Google Lens or video games like Pokemon Go, et cetera. And mixed reality is the most advanced version of AR, where we are, we are able to interact with both physical and digital elements at the same time. So what I'm going to show you is an amalgamation of these fields and the, these technologies and what they create uh, as new spatial conditions. So to break it down, I see these fields enabling architectural and urban realm in three different ways. So to begin with, we understand how some of these fields enable architects and designers to harness tools of design, communication, aid of fabrication or construction. That's probably the most uh, interpersonal way because you as a user engage with this medium and you're able to create and interact in the present day. So this by default disrupts the whole idea of how we interact with interfaces and it expands beyond the screens and it increases new spatial possibilities for architects where we also get to perceive the sense of scale and proportion, even be able to interact with it, see it, react and respond. It expands to a space of collaboration as well, where you can collaborate, iterate and take decisions with your teams. Like Mariana mentioned earlier, you can collaborate uh, virtually, uh, expanding beyond the screens here and also design, co-create your projects together. So that is the kind of time that we have right now with real-time interaction and real-time collaboration. So while there are plenty other applications for architects and designers with these mediums, what's also interesting is that these fields not just operate as a tool or operate as a medium where we just um, are able to carve out or map out our ideas, but then we are able to inhabit and live there socially and com uh, communally, which is really fascinating because from my understanding, there is no other medium which is not just flattened, but rather you can use it as a canvas to draw at the same time you can live within it as a canvas to inhabit. So a canvas that's used as a tool for creation at the same time can also be uh, a canvas which becomes a space of inhabitation. So that's uh, a really interesting factor with these immersive hybrid or virtual fields. And we can see a whole lot of emergence of social and interactive spaces coming up in the recent years, especially since the beginning of the pandemic, a lot more people have started engaging and immersing in these spaces. So the intimate space around us transforms in scale to a much larger interconnected field that simply cannot be neglected by architects. 
So we are all prepping up our avatars, stepping into the spatial social platforms such as Allspace, Mozilla Hubs, where we carry our personas through distinct avatars and interact, collaborate, and have events together. And we take it forward a little bit more, and we see that it expands into an arena of gamescapes, gamification, and principles um, that have been there since long, but in the recent years, it has expanded into an urban scale through various means, predominantly through location-based augmented reality, such as Pokemon Go. Looking at its predecessor, um, Ingress, Ingress is a predecessor to Pokemon Go. It's a location-based uh, game that scatters around the city and you interact with portals. The game also creates an overlaid point of interest through statues, sculptures, monuments, and public spaces. It, this kind of interaction and engagement, it brings a whole new semiotic value to the existing fabric of the city. So you understand your own existing city in multiple new different ways. And what is so fascinating is that the users interact and engage with an alternate map of their city, which is not simply an overlay, but rather it intersects through the various roads, arteries, and all the navigation paths and the social systems that we are conventionally used to. And it creates a complete new superimposition of how users wander through all these spaces. And users also plan, map out, and wander around the city, identifying these pockets and connect portals to conquer territories. So they're equipped with a level of sophistication where they annotate using custom drawing tools and distribute with their friends and community. So this creates a new social circle, new urban space utilization. And how interesting is that? So such a framework is not only limited to entertainment, but can also expand into an essential attribute such as education. This is one of my projects from 2016. This is probably the only project that I'm gonna show, which was done by me. And then I will show you a series of projects that we've developed together as Futurely. But uh, yeah, before that, so this is a snippet uh, from my experimental project, which talks about establishing a framework of geolocation-based education system where users need to commute between various locations to unlock and consume their academic modules. So imagine it as a Pokemon Go for education. So what happens when these kind of activities are not specific to leisure, but are integrated in your regular routine? So what I propose is Focus. Focus is an AR app that I envision for AR-based decentralized education system in the near future. This is based on the evolution of architect Cedric Price's Portrait's uh, Think Belt uh, and Berlin Free University project. There are some of these elements that set stage for this augmented city of the near future. I'm, I'm sure by the time when I was conceiving this project, it was near future, but then all of it is happening right now, guys. We are talking about a city level connectivity and availability of AR infrastructure and university education system that is gamified. So this is a short snippet of the project showcasing how such a framework would operate and function in the city. There are new breeding activities that become more relevant while developing the evolving urban infrastructures. It's a disruptive change and it's not limited to the pedestrian movement patterns only, but for the commute and transport networks as a whole. So that's a reason why it's termed this focus is also because what is rewarding in the present day for all of us is how can you eliminate all forms of digital distractions and to be able to focus on one particular task or a subject at a given point of time. Now, as you can see, that brings us a lot of new interesting questions. How do you declutter yourself when you have so much of excess um, digital distractions around you? How do you focus on something such as education and learning with a space around us like this? With that being said, that's, that's where um, this project was targeted towards. Let me move on to Futurely. Futurely is the recent initiative that we conceived during the turbulent times. It was the beginning of the pandemic last year. And it has really presented us with unforeseen scenarios to rethink, reconfigure, 
and uh, how architecture and design and education works during these change times. Thankfully, with collaborators such as Mariana herself and uh, now with Provides, we have been able to pull together an amazing year of um, changing or contributing to the education game online. So if at all, to give a single positive credit to COVID-19, I would just credit the fact that the increased global connectivity is the major highlight, especially for architects and designers, because this behavior wouldn't have existed or wouldn't have accelerated otherwise. Before, when we used to conduct events and workshops, there would be so much of logistics and planning that was involved, but now we're all here. So I will take you through a series of projects that were conceived at uh, Futurely. So this was during our first event last year through Digital Futures. Um, yeah, tomorrow the new Digital Futures commences. So we tried to work on the idea of workspaces. How do workspaces evolve? How do workspaces um, operate in virtual reality? How do you interact? And this project specifically attempts to take the characteristics of serene and divine um, elements and how does it create an ambient mindset in your workspace? I'm not going to go much into detail with a lot, all of these projects because of the interest of time. And this is another project that speculates on a space for creators to come together virtually and engage in a place where they collaborate, create, and make, and even showcase their projects or artwork. And this specific student is also a wonderful student of Mariana. While in another project, it was a virtual adaptation of Hyperloop the transportation system as we all know it and how it can operate as an apparatus in virtual reality how does a conventional transportation system transform while operating in vr do you need a trans uh, transportation system in vr so such are the questions we try to engage with and how do you work with different pods and modules etc so beyond the conventional architectural conditions um, I'd like to specifically mention this project where it's really fascinating because this project attempts to create a miniature planet and takes you through alienated landscapes filled with portals and deliberation modes of circulation. So as you saw, that was a chair where a person sat and then they immediately got teleported to a different location. So we begin to question various circulation systems, manipulation of physical constraints, such as lowering the gravity how do you gamify architectural spaces? As a whole, the participants engage with not just architectural form, but also different modes of interacting with the space and also work with various materiality, colors and textures that are not possible in the physical conditions. And this thankfully was also um, a series of workshops which came together as a studio and Mariana was also a part of this. And that's how we kicked off this event bringing in different dimensions and different viewpoints, uh, four to five of us uh, instructors, as mentioned below, we came together and brought this into action. So I think uh, I will move forward with that. This is another project, which is a concert space in uh, virtual reality. Yeah. This brings me to the final project that I will be showing you guys today. It's, it's a really supercharged project where the team documented a small town in Greece using drones and photogrammetry. The data is utilized in order to create an assemblage as we see. The captured data often, uh, what's interesting is it's broken, fragmented, and it comprises of chunks of the actual space. So the memory landscapes as a project attempt, attempt, uh, attempts to reassemble the essence of this whole virtual space in a fragmented manner, embracing the machinic imperfections and creating an alternate way of immersing the small town. That being said, thank you. What we saw is one of the many facets of what we do at Futurely. Something I personally associate with, um, as a platform, we still bring a plethora of subdomains, knowledge expertise from different parts of the world and from different instructors. 
Yeah, and I personally engage with speculation as a toolkit, a mindset for developing models and systems that are not only architectural, but also expand into organizational systems and management systems as well. And yes, of course, for the next party, you're all invited. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful um, presentation. Usually I start the round table with a small reading, but because of time, I think we should just skip that and go directly to the question because I have a lot that I'm interested in. Um, the first one that uh, really inspired me was actually uh, the similarities of conceptualization of actually looking at architecture. For instance, uh, Mariana would also does uh, talk about Blade Runner and Vamsi's work. It's a lot in video gaming as well. And also this component of foreign reality. For instance, uh, Blade Runner was came coming a lot from my hometown, Hong Kong. And obviously there's a difference between what they think Hong Kong is and what Hong Kong really is, especially for international offices or practices. How do you actually ensure that your speculation touches the ground of not just the physical ground, but actually the real social economic grounds? Maybe I can start. Um, so 